I would like to welcome you to Life Boost here. I'm really excited to share my content with you. I'm really excited to have this one-on-one -on -one conversation with you. I really have a passion for saving lives and making a difference for individuals within their day-to-day -day life. And I really like to help within mental health, spiritual health, and physical health. I like to focus on all of those different types of aspects. Today, we're gonna to be talking about a man that has made a substantial impact on the world of mental health and the community within Toronto, Ontario, Canada. He's a leader of a movement that has been in the spotlight for very some time and he is making an impact on those that are suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder also known as PTSD and it's very stigmatized in our society and within first responders throughout Canada and it's been a very big issue I really want to be able to try to make an impact this man here he solved international cases involving the importing and exporting of cocaine he was in the forest and he investigated crimes such as money laundering, extortion, kidnapping, forcible confinement, mass murder, mutilations, human trafficking, weapons trafficking, nuclear weapons trafficking. This man has literally fucking done it all. This guy is a 23 year old veteran of the Toronto Police Service in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. He was a frontline police officer making his way eventually to the organized crime unit and drug squad and he ended his career as a homicide detective which is fucking insane, right? Like this guy has seen a lot of different graphics and different things throughout his career and it's not just a frontline officer this guy has been in multiple different types of divisions this is just a part of his resume this is not including everything that this man has done and as quoted by the man himself right for 14 years of his career he was involved in the war of drugs i'd really like to introduce jason colehart my very good friend and also my guest here welcome jason thanks so much ryan wow thank you for saying all that you know as you're mentioning all those things i was reflecting on all those times you know it's it's quite been quite an emotional ride for me you know say the very least i've always loved being a police officer i loved uh helping people that's why i signed up i signed up to make a difference to lock bad guys up and i did that for a long time you know and as you mentioned i did it from a lot of different aspects i did it from the alleyways and the streets of downtown toronto to the neighborhoods to the communities across canada and around the world that are involved in the drug trade and really truly open up my mind to the war on drugs and the effects of it you know it's it's incredible the amount of crime involved in just the trafficking of illegal narcotics like you mentioned not just the actual product itself but the ripple effect from those crimes really truly opened my mind like one of the aspects that i, I worked in i was on the heroin team in toronto so we focused on the importing of heroin and ephedrine from their native countries afghanistan iran uh, india and that was during the time of the Afghan war where there's a lot of different forces that were in Afghanistan at that time. And the farmers, their main product that they could produce was the poppy flower. And that's a derivative of opium, which then is refined into heroin, um, which now we found on the streets today that's cut with a whole bunch of other things, including fentanyl and car fentanyl now. And literally killing thousands of people. So during this journey, I did a lot of my own research to kind of understand the intricacies of the drug importing networks worldwide and how they operated with their laundering of monies and their shell companies and the movement of commodities and, and how they would move those commodities, meaning drugs, uh, worldwide. Very intriguing to say the very least. And that's what I really truly enjoyed was figuring out all of the dots connecting these operations. and. I found in Afghanistan, like I mentioned, the farmers have the ability to grow the poppy flower and that gives them about $300 every three months, uh, four times a year to feed their family. And back then, uh, the crops were being destroyed. They were being burned, they were being sprayed by either the coalition forces, by the Taliban. And now you have families all over Afghanistan who don't have an income um, because number one, the poppy flower is illegal and they can't do it. So now they're left as uh, basically a third world country. Cocaine, you have the same thing in South America up the trade routes through Mexico. Uh, you follow those routes and you look at the mass murders that happen. I believe it was 80,000 murders a year in Mexico alone about 10, 15 years ago. A lot of that directly related to the drug trade. Not much of the enforcement that I did uh, made a, a positive impact, to say the very least. There wasn't a lot of life-saving that we did, although we did take illegal drugs and guns and whatnot off the street. It didn't seem to change much of anything. So when I came out of the drug squad, 
Uh, I worked in homicide for three years, and I was dealing mainly with uh, homicides from the higher echelon of the organized crime world at that point, which was interestingly enough connected to my previous eight years in organized crime and major drugs. So I essentially saw the war on drugs from every aspect, to including mental health, the addicts, the people whom I was told to arrest when I was a young officer doing street level drugs to secure evidence to ensure our safety and that community of addicts and drug dealers is generally armed. So when we arrest them, it's uh, generally done quickly, forcefully to ensure everyone's safety, including theirs. Unfortunately, at times they do get hurt and that was the job, you know, that's what we were told to do. You know, you have to go out there, you have to secure the evidence. And the Canadian Evidence Act gives us the authority to use as much force as necessary to secure evidence from destruction. So when you have a crack addict swallow a 20 piece of crack, $20 piece of crack cocaine, you are given the authority under the Canadian Evidence Act to use as much force as necessary to secure that evidence, up to including choking them out. It's pretty fucking terrible. Absolutely terrible. Terrible, yeah. you know. Like now on that, and I'm, I'm truly heartbroken by being number one forced to do that and now seeing from a different perspective of, of the hurt that that continuously causes in a perpetually insane system that we're living in. So do you feel that it's going to make a bigger impact for society if we transition to that type of discipline versus the discipline we do now? Definitely things need to change. I haven't done a tremendous amount of research and what I am aware of is basically the United States itself has changed the way that our mental health and the way that our physical health is managed. Part of my journey, just to kind of give you a little bit of perspective of this, uh, I was an addict, a uh, porn addict, alcohol addict. Uh, I was raped when I was 10 years old, triggered by an event at work similar to that, amongst all the other things that I dealt with. And that for me was a lot of things for me to, to overcome. I ended up going down to a retreat center that was uh, incredible. Um, it has an 87% healing rate for anxiety, a 91% healing rate for depression. And I went down there and I was one of those statistics. I came back healed. Um, I had a miraculous uh, event, a supernatural event. In fact, uh, what the doctors and the psychiatrists determined to be psychosis, uh, bipolar, schizophrenia, open visions. Uh, it was very impactful. I was healed instantly. In a moment, I was lifted up into the cosmos. I was shown basically my life from the beginning to the end, the way I'm going now and, and how I need to change directions. Kind of like the Scrooge story. I saw a trillion colors of light. I met uh, a whole bunch of different uh, old people. They told me stuff and it was, it was incredible. Um, it really, truly <laughs> blew my mind. And I went to the psychiatric unit as an outpatient. So I was under the care of psychiatrists prior to this experience, taking uh, so many pills. Um, I had taken over 12 different types of psychiatric medications over the five year period. Last three years of my career with homicide, I was experienced daily experiencing daily panic attacks, waking up every morning with a, in my chest and then just expand. I start to convulse, throw up, sweat, and I'm driving to work in my pretty suit and I got a cup to throw up in, a cup of water and a tea towel over my suit, get into work and wash my face and go in and everything's fine. Like nobody had any clue about what was, what was happening with me. When did you realize there was an issue with your mental and physical health? Like when was the time when you were in this position, you just said, I couldn't handle it any longer? That was, yeah, that was May 2017. That was after three years in homicide. Uh, homicide wasn't really what triggered there were the events from my time in organized crime, dealing with the things that I dealt with. That was a moment that I booked off sick. Um, and I just said, I can't do this anymore. And then the following, so that was May 2017. So May, June, July, August, September, October, November, six months had passed. And I was given a psychologist, but that was it medicated. I was having thoughts of suicide. I had made intricate plans to actually end my life. I have three daughters who are 18, 15, and 13 now. Basically, that's when I went down to this retreat center, which are almost opening up the door, going up the highway, put myself into a coma because uh, I didn't want to continually experience the shocks and uh, the depression and the lack of any emotion at all. I was numb. I felt like a dial tone. And it was torture. Like I remember saying to my friends, if you want to torture the ISIS people, give them PTSD. Like this is this is absolutely terrible what I'm going through. I kill myself on a regular basis. 
And that was a problem, you know. And finally, I went down to this retreat center. And my original request, I when I was originally asked to go, I, I said no, because uh, it had to do with Jesus. And I'm a, I'm a detective. I only believe in what I can see, feel, hear, and touch. Uh, so I said thanks anyways. And that's when I had my hand on the car door and almost opened it up to, you know. And then I thought, all right, whatever, you know. I got to I gotta do something. Take me to this place. He said it has a, a success rate of 87%, 91%, sure, whatever. So I went down there and I actually learned. I learned about the true cause and effect of our injuries. I learned about why. I learned how to release. I learned how to recognize. I learned how to forgive. I learned, I learned how to love. I learned what love was. I learned about healing, you know. And it really, truly blew my mind the way that this information was presented to me. And as a skeptic in what I used to call religion, uh, what I now call the truth, was incredible. Like one of the first things that the doctor said, and I say doctor because he used to be a medical doctor and he was giving out prescriptions all kind and decided I'm not really helping people. So he grew up in a Christian household. His dad was a pastor and he was a nice guy. So he left the whole ministry and turned his back on that. So then he went back. And he started to do a little bit, a lot of research, actually. He started to do a lot of research into the cause and effect of our injuries. And he found, you know, certain things are caused by what we do and what we experience in our life. And also from our generation, cancers are passed down, heart disease is passed down, mental health is passed down, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And he wanted to figure out why. And he ended up figuring out over 80% of these illnesses and why they enter our bodies. And they are generationally passed on, such as cancers, in women so breast cancer in women in the left breast environmental impactors aside suggest and have been proven to be related to anger resentment unforgiveness and rage towards a female blood relative in that person's life the right side is a male or a non-blood relative again environmental impactors aside what you eat what you sit around your environment also contributes to us because we're a triune being we're a spiritual being made up of a soul which is our mind will and emotions and we live in a motor home, which is our body. So we have to filter and fuel all three areas properly in order to be in perfect optimal health. And it's hard. So, and I get kind of get taken off track sometimes. So we got to Oh, no, no, it's to, okay. I just uh, didn't want to interrupt yeah. you. You're saying a lot of Greek content. Yeah. Yeah. So at this, at this place that I went to is called Be in Health. Mm -hmm. And it's a program called For My Life. He began to make sense to me. And I was like reflecting on other people in my life that had different injuries, such as eczema. And eczema, for example, he gave an example of a mother and a father who brought their 10-month-old baby to him and had eczema over 90% of his face. And the pastor, former doctor, said to the mom and dad, which one of the two of you didn't want to have this baby? And the mom said, well, I guess that was me. I wanted to have a girl, not a boy. And the doctor says, well, your boy became aware of that as soon as you became aware of their sex. You rejected him. You probably haven't nurtured him properly. And that's why this is happening. So he said to them, I want you to go home. I want you to stop this behavior. I want you to love that boy like you should have. You're probably not breastfeeding it. No, he's on formula. Start breastfeeding that boy and say this prayer of repentance that you, you, you're you sore, you're gonna change your ways, you're gonna do better. And then two months later, the, the boy's face is clear of eczema. And I reflected on other people in my life and known their, their upbringing, whether they were an unwanted child or, or not loved properly as a child. And you look at their physical state and they have eczema, they have psoriasis. The other thing that he's proven is that asthma and respiratory illnesses are related to the fear of abandonment or being abandoned. So think about being six years old and your parents take you and they throw you in the forest at nighttime, they run away. How does your respiratory system change? <laughs> so if you're in a constant state of fear of being abandoned, you're gonna have a respiratory illness. So now we have COVID related respiratory illnesses because people are left alone in the hospital without their grandkids and sons and daughters coming to see them. They've been abandoned, you know, and, and when you begin to understand the true cause and effect, you can reverse these things. You can start recognizing where you've gone wrong, where family members have gone wrong, and even in treating you terribly at times. What I began to recognize is something that I used to say to bad guys on a physical level was, you're not a bad person, you've just done a bad thing. And that's, that's really true. Because if you look at murder, there have been a few murderers out there who have been deemed not clinically sane to go to trial, so they don't go to jail. Um, I would actually submit that every single suicide and every single homicide is a result of a mental illness, period. You're not in a state, you're not in a sane frame of mind when you're committing murder. Even if you're in self-defense, you're not in a sane frame of mind. Um, and, and it was very explosive, the education that I had, came back from there, 
had that supernatural experience and then explained to the psychiatrist during an outpatient appointment that I had met God. Uh, I was healed. I didn't need the medication anymore. We got into an argument. I ended up getting committed under the Mental Health Act for being a danger to her. Security guards ran down the hallway. I think they're looking to tackle me in this little room and I'm not a big fella, so I just submitted to walking with them, get in the elevator and there was a whole bunch of people in there, all for me, just thinking I was a scary dude or something like that. Uh, asked me to empty my pockets out, how come is my badge? Security guards like, oh, you're a cop? I'm like, yep. He's like, throw it in the bag. I was like, all right. So a few hours later, I'm upstairs in the intensive care unit, locked in a room. Thank God they didn't strap me down to the bed because I wasn't being violent in any way, shape, or form. I just had a loud voice. And I was in there for 21 days uh, against my will. I was committed on a Form 1, Form 3, and a Form 4 for uh, the initial assessment, and then 14 days, and then again for another 30 days. And it was very educational experience, very explosively traumatic as well, not only from the experiences that I personally went through, but also seeing what other people had gone through during those 21 days. I was like the grade 12 guy doing his third year. Like I, I saw so many people come through there, and I spoke to as many people as I could just because that's the type of guy I am. Um, I got in trouble at times speaking to people. I stopped my roommate from slitting his wrist with a, a shank that he made from a cookie tin. I was told that I'm not a police officer in there and I was deemed to be in possession of a knife the next day and that was part of my 14-day committal because the doctor read what he read and misinterpreted the events. What other physical symptoms did you experience in the jail? Sorry, not in the jail, but like in the mental health institution. Like what did you experience in that area? Yeah, I, as an inmate, in that mental health area, that's a good term. I wanted to jump through the window. So they gave me a medication called Seroquel. Okay. And uh, I was, uh, the first night I took it, I remember having tremendous nightmares. And I was calculating how thick the window was going out onto Stimcoe Street towards the clock tower, the digital clock there, because I was going to jump through it. Like I was just going out of my mind. And uh, I went down to the nurse's station because I figured I'm not really heavy enough to get through both windows. I'd probably just bounce off it like I did at that search warrant door. Yeah, that was actually funny. So anyways, I went down to the nurse's station and said, hey, uh, I, I want to jump through the window and I want to kill myself and I'm not feeling good. I'm having nightmares. And he said, go back to sleep. And I was like, what? Sleep? Nightmares? That doesn't work. So that's kind of some of the, the experiences I had. I had my life threatened two or three times by other uh, inmates, uh, patients, sorry. Um, that sucked. Um, my whole story is actually on YouTube. I uh, locked up for 21 days. There's quite a lot. Being a man in law enforcement, did you feel shame or embarrassment to reach out for support as there is a stigma against men showing vulnerability in that type of way? Did you find that like it was hard for you to reach out to the other programs or when you did get out of that 21 day facility in the mental health hospital, when you got out, did you feel that there was some form of shame, embarrassment or anything? Uh, so two sided question. The first side with work, I had no help from the system around me. Pride definitely got in the way of me booking off sick. Uh, I was a homicide detective and I'd done all these things in organized crime. I, I figured, you know, I, I can't book off sick. I'm, I got all these things happening. And, and the stigma as well, too, like there's a, there was, there still is a huge stigma surrounding mental health and PTSD. And it was interesting after I booked off, working on all of those teams that I worked on, maybe two guys reach out to me now. And I work with hundreds of people. That's you know, it. There's just, only two people that reached out to you. Yeah, on a, on a consistent basis. The, the rest, I guess they just don't know how to talk to me. They don't know what to say. They don't know. I get it, you know, and there is that stigma surrounding it. What's a way do you think that law enforcement can do to change that stigma? Because like every day when you're out there, you're out there risking your life. You're out there with your partner. You're in that patrol vehicle. You're going down the streets. You're going into several dangerous environments. And you know what I mean? You go through this traumatic event that you just that you just had and then you tell people you reach out for that help you reach out for that assistance but then there's only two people out of the entire police force that actually is consistently worried about your mental health you know what i mean i think that's a really big problem to really focus on is that why why as police officers are only focused on the negativity and not trying to make things positive in a way where we can focus on rehabilitation for their officers because it's just it's insane that there's only been two people to actually reach out for help in that incident right so it's crazy yeah yeah, yeah. and what i what i mean that like two people that have called me to ask me how i am and i i talked to a lot of other 
frontline workers now who are in the same situation. The majority of people that I talk to now are also injured uh, with an operational stress injury. And it is a common theme that many of us are left out there to dry without any resources to help us. They give us a psychologist. And, you know, psychology is very centered on specific ways of doing psychology, such as cognitive behavior therapy or EMDR, that they work for some, you know, and, and my psychologist has been somewhat beneficial. I'd say he's maybe less than 2% of my recovery. Uh, what I've found with my recovery is I needed to do a lot of different things by multiple things in order to repair. I've taken part in equine therapy, canine therapy. Peer-to-peer -peer support is, is so important, you know, to be around people who understand you, who understand the injury. And going back to your question about how do you change that environment at work, you have somebody in that car beside you who has been there, who has been in that hole. So when you go to your partner and you, you don't get locked up, you don't go to the hospital, you don't get charged, you get taken to a safe environment where we can help you, where we can give you proper resources, we can give you options. Art therapy has been a huge part of my recovery in, in every aspect, music, woodworking, painting, journaling, and I could go on. It's, it's incredible the things you, you could reach out to, the elements of nature uh, have helped me ecotherapy, meditation, prayer, reflection, so many different aspects to peel back the layers of hurt because we're not just injured because of one thing. We might suspect it's one thing, but that one thing is an injury that is triggered from another thing. You know, and it, it could be a big family tree of triggers. I know for me it was. I had to put together a traumatic timeline to bring out all of the traumatic experiences in my life going back to birth. And it was a it was a difficult journey, you know, and it's a necessary journey um, to go through. The ability to prevent these things from happening to begin with is where we should actually be starting by educating people about the things you might experience when you're at work. We see it on TV. We see what the first responders go through. We, we know that. But when you experience it in real life, when your finger's on that trigger and you're just about to take somebody's life, but you don't, that, that has an emotional response, unless you're a psychopath which unfortunately a lot of the services kind of train you to be that way, to be a robot, to just put the uniform on, do your job, go call to call. What's wrong, you got sour belly or is your job? Was that a stinky one? You didn't like that last sudden death? You didn't like the back of that guy's face not being where it's supposed to be? What about the, the you know, the, the neck, you know, when they hang, you didn't like that? What's wrong with you? Come on, let's go drink. Oh, okay, I guess that's what we do. You know, and you just continuously call after call after call, you put these thoughts and emotions which you're not allowed to experience onto what I call a rock. You throw it in your backpack and they just keep going in, call after call, experience just, after experience. They just keep adding it and adding it and adding it. Yeah. And it gets much more worse, right? And right. the police force is not really doing anything in regards to help and assistance in regards to that. After going through these experiences one after another, right? They don't really give you that much time or delay because you have so many other files that you have to work on, right? And not at all. And for example, Ryan, right, I'll tell you a prime example of a fellow I was talking to last week, a first responder from Alberta, Jasper. So a few years ago, he was involved in the bus rollover. If you remember that, that happened, the, the bustle of people that rolled down the hill and it was catastrophic. A lot of people lost their lives. And he and I believe it was six or eight other police officers, six I believe, were alone uh, for two and a half hours waiting for paramedics, fire, uh, other assistants to arrive. They're police officers. They get a badge on their shoulder that says first aid. That's it. You know, they got first aid kits, they got warming blankets. That's it. That's all. Uh, next day, what, what do you think happened with them? They went to work. Like that day. blew my freaking mind. Yeah, and, and it doesn't actually day. surprise me because you look at a young street shooting, you look at the, the van attacks, you look at whatever event you want to look at, they're there the next day. Some just because they get up and say, fuck it, I'm going in, I'm a tough guy, I got a badge, this is my job, I'm sorry that that happened, blah, blah, blah. And others just because they're expected to, you know, and others because where do I go from here? I, I, I'm part of this team and, you know, we did this thing and you gotta be, be together. One of the experiences that I had as a homicide cop is we were we were looking for a bad guy and uh, we sent out a bunch of teams and intelligence and plain clothes and in gang units and stuff to, to find our fella. And they found him down in the entertainment district one night and uh, they ended up trying to arrest him. It ended up in a big shootout. Uh, he gets killed. One of the cops gets shot in the holster. The video is actually online, CTV News, Quasi Skeen Peters, the, the suspect's name. Dash cam cut the entire, the entire thing. There was at least eight, 12 officers involved in that interaction. One of them killed him, uh, obviously. They all got injured from that incident. They didn't 
get the proper resources to repair from it, uh, although a few of them are back at work right now. And there's a number of those that I, like people that I've talked to on my network involved at work with things and the diffusing and the debriefing sessions are required and they, they happen. However, the environment isn't there for people to openly and honestly feel their emotions because of the judgment and also because the fear of losing stature, losing your position, being judged. And it's a tough environment to work in. But what, what we see right now is that there are so many people out there that are injured from PTSD that they're not at work. They're working to half capacity. They're alcoholics while they're police officers. That's not a good thing, you know? And now what we have is in Toronto, I believe we have at least 500 members of the Toronto Police Service that are currently not at work. And I believe it's higher than that. Uh, and there are people who are at work who they call the walking wounded, uh, physically or mentally injured. They put them in what unfortunately is called the cabbage patch, um, which is just a room that they do filing and paperwork in. So when I started as a police officer in 1996, we had 25 to 30 officers show up per shift. When I was a sergeant in 22 division in 2008, one night I put out six officers in the entire 22 division. And that's a massive division. And how big would you estimate that size is for, so that people could understand like how big is that environment? Like around like 15 kilometers you'd say oh no 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 it's uh like in on in toronto uh it's from the 401 down to the lake from the 427 over to park lawn area so it's a massive like to get from one area. corner to the other it could take up to 20 minutes of lights and sirens in that division so if i have six officers on the road we have a traffic accident all of a sudden we got three four cars doing traffic points now we have a domestic, I got two officers there. Now we got an armed robbery in progress or a home invasion in progress. We got to call other divisions yeah, to come in. You know, and there was reports in 2018 in Toronto of a homicide scene going unanswered for two hours. Home invasions, people are having their homes physically invaded, calling 911. And the cops show up an hour or two, three later, and they're like, hi, not their fault. There's only six of them on the road. So they get stressed out. So next week you got five on the road. And now we have what we have right now, which is people shooting people, people killing people, drug dealers everywhere. Like it's crazy. It's absolutely crazy the way that these mental health injuries are not being healed. And then you have officers who are injured and they're out there and they're beating people up because they're angry, because they're drunk, because they're hurt. Yeah, because they're hurt on the inside and they have no other right. way to actually fix it. They have no way to yeah. actually create a solution problem. So then they go out there and then they use the powers that they have as a police officer to put right. it into their own hands. And yeah. and I really do and think... And nobody yeah. on the job, actually, I just want to conclude that with this. Sorry. No police officer that I have kind of come in contact with gets on the job to hurt people. I, I, I can't... I don't think anyone that I know of signed up to be a police officer, to hurt people, to kill people at all. And... and the system surrounding them, you know, it it can really change who they are yeah, because the 100%. thing is, if they're gonna like, you know what I mean? Like you have these guys that are applying to the police service. You already know how hard nowadays it is to be a cop. You have to go through several processes to be a cop in Canada. The issue is, is that we have a lot of these cookie cutters, you know what I mean? There's a lot of people that get into the system and, you know, they don't have that life experience. They don't have that, they don't really have the same experience as a lot of individuals within society, right? They, they're very, um, the process within Smart. itself is very cookie cut, meaning that like, yeah. you know, yeah, you, they're you can't do this. Book smart. You can't do that. Yeah, you can be book smart, but are they actually life? Like, do they have any life experience? Are yeah. they educational in any way? Yes, you can yeah. have a degree, but in reality, does anyone give a fuck about a degree? No, no one cares no. about a fucking degree. They care about how you talk to them, how you can relate to them, and how, how you can fix that situation at hand, right? Because yeah. because the issue is, is people are like, well, I have a degree in this, I have a degree in that. Well, that's great and all, but are you able to de-escalate someone that's cutting off, um, cutting off their arm? and being able to like you know de-escalate that situation from stopping yeah. happening nobody with yeah. a degree can go up to someone and do that because you've never dealt with that situation so and that, that's an yeah. impactful thing yeah go ahead right so like for me it's just like you know what i mean we're really failing our officers by the lack of training the lack of understanding as a seriousness right. for your mental health and i really do feel that a lot of mental health training needs to be applied to these police officers on a daily basis i really think think that you know every year they 
should be doing repetitive courses on ways of how to be successful within the job because not just police but everywhere else the burnout rate is fucking insane because of the fact mm. that you know when they get home from work they don't know how to talk it out they don't know and then they put it on their wives and then and then you wonder why that the divorce rate is so high for police officers and for all these emergency services and it's just yep. because they have nowhere to go to they have no resources they have no help to really do and and the only way that like you said earlier jason is you know you go and you take a prescription or you go and you speak to a psychologist and then they yeah. and then they just go through this bullshit process with you instead of actually saying what's wrong with you what's the problem that we can fix and let's try to create a solution to the problem, right? And 100%. you know, like like you said earlier, right? Like there's different ways that people can really be successful within their stressful lives, right? Like you can do art therapy, you can do physical exercise, you can do one-on-one -on -one counseling, right? But yeah. but giving someone a pill is just creating a bigger problem to the whole situation, right? And and I think the issue is is that these police officers, the people like you said that are damaged, that are on the road, that are trying to you know, make ends meet for their family. They're the ones that are taking these prescriptions because they don't want to lose their jobs. And we're kind of forcing police to make the wrong mistakes because, you know, we're not really dealing with the task at hand. It's kind of like a security blanket. That that okay. pill that we give to them is like a blanket to say, okay, he's okay. If he takes that pill, it's okay. But in reality, he is not okay. He's not fine. Right. And and he needs these professional help that acquires this, right? And, and there's yeah. nothing wrong with that. I think there is nothing absolutely wrong with that. And there should be a lot of protocols in place to really stop this mental health barrier from really happening because I see it within my job. I see it within your career within policing and and for mental health all around like firefighters and ambulance and police and and all those industries go through so much shit that you know they really need to take that step back and really reassess themselves and really understand that you know i got to focus on me and i got i can't really focus on that right now i got to focus on me yeah. because my main goal is that i got to love myself and like going back to to what you were saying earlier too right is that there's people that hate hate themselves right there's people that are really they really attack who they are they attack their character yep. they attack who they are because of their past experiences and the environment that they're in but when they were first hired as a cop they were working at a very decent job probably they were working towards a career within policing they were in a positive environment but then once you put on that badge and once you put on that uniform and when you get into the actual job and it's hands-on it always looks greener on the other side you know what i mean it always looks greener being like yeah. yeah you know what it's sick he's got a uniform he's got a badge and he's got a sick career he has a lot of diversity within the role i'm super yeah. excited right but like it's just what else does the police need to offer and that's the question that is a big issue because of budgeting obviously finances and the issues that are going on within society for police alone right so you know i think that there needs to be a lot of changes for mental health because if we don't make a stand for this i really think it's going to get worse for all police services like if you look at rcmp if you look at policing services within ontario or anywhere right but it's just insane that we're not doing anything about it watching the problem happen just like the pandemic of everything going on everyone's sad everyone's like i'm not able to go out anywhere i'm not able to do anything i'm not able to do this and people are just following whatever the government is asking them to do people That's are just right. following it and complying with that direction why mm -hmm. why are they following that direction it's because the system's broken because people are not right. focusing on emotional and physical health of their well-being and that's a big issue people are very busy busy people but we always tend to forget to make time for ourselves. and i really do think that there's not enough time to really rehabilitate because they push you from case to case to case and they push you so hard that you're just like a number more than an individual or a name you know what i mean and i and i really do think that there needs to be changes in that area for sure because it's just the PTSD has been going through the roof and it's been an, an, a big topic that a lot of people are talking about right now and I'm glad that it's starting to get out but there's still a lot of work that needs to get done. There's still a lot of work and change that needs to happen for the better for people to be successful, right? People are complaining about police response and how police are reacting to situations, right? And the issue is, is that police are doing what they're trained to do. They're doing what they're trained 
under the government. They're being trained, what they're being taught at the academy. And a lot of people don't understand that, you know, there needs to be implementation in regards to the training aspect so that we can respond better to mental health calls, respond better in regards to every call. Because if we're not able to handle that stress factor, then people are just going to go down the wall. People are just going to get really hurt. And that's something that I don't ever want to see, right? But a good situation is something that happened with you, right? Where it became so bad that you had to go to a mental health hospital to get help. And then when you, like, get out... Actually, no, I didn't need to go to the mental health hospital for help in any way, shape, or form. Uh, Not at all. I was there to tell them that I'm done with your system, that I've found God, and I don't need your help. And then they kidnapped me. They forcibly confined me. They administered noxious substances to me. They all collaborated together and made money off of me. And that is a criminal organization. Clear cut definition of a criminal organization. That's a problem. You know, they spend over $16 billion a year on a pharmaceutical industry that is the fourth leading cause of death in Canada. That's a problem, Ryan. That's a huge problem. Yet we perpetuate this system consistently by doing what we're doing. We kill people on the streets with mental health issues that are having knives and brandishing knives and we're forced to kill them, you know? We were forced to take them to a safe place, which is a psychiatric unit. I was there for 21 days. I didn't feel safe. So I understand why people don't want to go there. There is a problem with the system. You know, it's something that has to be changed entirely, entirely. You know, the truth has to stand. People's voices have to be heard. Like, why are police officers, paramedics, and firefighters consistently responding to calls for service for mental health? You know, when someone gets injured in a car accident and they're taken to the hospital, they have their bones repaired. They have x-rays, they have MRIs done. They have all these things put together so that they can heal. And then they're given programs. They can walk again. They can throw a baseball again. You never, ever have police officers and paramedics and firefighters attending calls two days after someone gets into an accident because they gave them pills and threw them outside. Why is our mental health system doing the same thing? You know, And I'm specifically talking about our emergency mental health system. There are a lot of psychiatrists out there that actually do sit and talk to people. Pills are effective as a bridge at times. And I want to say at times because statistics show that a very low percentage of the population is positively affected by pharmaceutical medications. You look at the NNI and the NND numbers and the ratios that they determine the effectiveness, um, it's alarming. Know. <clears throat> and when you bring back that true statistic that pharmaceutical drugs are the fourth leading cause of death in Canada, cancer, heart disease, and accidents are above that, that's a problem. You won't find that on Health Canada's website. You know, you actually have to look at real documents to get that. That's a problem. You know, like last week I was out in a small town around where I'm living right now helping to feed the less fortunate at a hotel. And there was a woman there who was having emotional distress. And there was a police officer and a paramedic there. And all I heard this girl screaming was, I don't want to go to the hospital. You can't take me to the hospital. Don't take me to the hospital. Interesting question. Why don't you want to go to the hospital? That's the safe place, quote unquote, that under the Mental Health Act, these kind police officers and paramedics are required to take you to. Why don't you want to go to this safe place? Can you tell me? You know, and then ask people another question. Tell us about your experience with the currently insured mental health system. And start to listen. And start to hear what people say. You know, opioid overdoses are going through the roof right now. You know, we have a pharmaceutical industry, again, that is perpetuating that. And in my research that I did after I came out of that hospital, I had to make sense of everything. I had to figure out why that happened, what system behind them allowed them to forcibly confine me, kidnap me, and because they said you will not be released unless you take medications. You know, I was forced to take them. They didn't physically pin me down or inject me or anything like that, but I was coerced into taking medications and it really, truly messed me around, man. So when I came out of there, I had to figure stuff out. I had to figure out why, how this happened. So through my research, I, I went back a long way. I went back and found out legislation that was introduced in 1914 by a fellow by the name of Harry J. Hainslinger, and he introduced the Harrison Act of 1914. That made the poppy flower and the cocoa leaf illegal which we now call opium and heroin and cocaine, which are deadly substances, the heroin and the cocaine, for sure, you know, in their chemical format. I've done quantitative analysis on heroin. At best, you're looking at 15%. Cocaine, maybe 20%. The rest of it's not that. Fentanyl, carfentanyl, and every other junk that every other cutter puts before it, you know. And then in 1918, the first diagnostic symptom manual comes out in 
that basically tells us about her psychiatric illnesses, quote unquote, such as psychosis, dreams and visions that I had on December the 11th, 2017, schizophrenia, you know, words outside of my head from God, you know, that was weird. You know, all these different things that I experienced are in the diagnostic symptom manual. Is psychosis bad when you're chopping somebody's head off? Yeah. Is psychosis bad when you're floating in the clouds with Jesus and healing? and being taken back to your traumatic event to break your soul ties and to reassociate yourself and to see that traumatic event from a different perspective not that narrow lensed focus that you were involved in at that point and that's where i get my forgiveness from that's cool man you know that, that works for me but apparently they don't want us to do these things because if we allow ourselves to self-heal the way i have all of a sudden you're not spending thousands I'd say probably tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars they spent on me and my quote-unquote health care through the pharmaceutical industries and all the specialists that they sent me to trying to address the physical symptoms of my underlying operational stress injuries. It's absolutely incredible to me to, to find this research out. And then in 1930s, Henry Ford uh, made and fueled vehicles using hemp, otherwise known as marijuana, the other side of it. Uh, in 1937... The U.S. government brought in the Marijuana Tax Act, which made marijuana a scheduled substance, meaning it had no medicinal value, basically crushed the marijuana. So now we have a pharmaceutical industry that mimics opioids, and cocaine, and uh, other effects of marijuana. And we have concrete industry, we have a pharmaceutical industry, we have an oil industry that, from my perspective, has a lot of organized crime involved in all of those industries. We also have an illegal drug trade of the poppy flower and the cocoa leaf. Cocoa leaf was chewed in ancient times to subside hunger and increase energy, build the pyramids perhaps. You know, the poppy flower has seeds, sap, and leaves used for surgeries, for sedation. Now we're mimicking those things. And look at the overdoses we have from synthetic opioids now. Look at the amount of people dying over a quote-unquote war on drugs. Look at the amount of people dying on the war on mental health. You know, the system has to change. And I'm not saying that we need to make heroin and cocaine illegal in its sorry legal in its current form and provide safe injection sites no that's not the answer they're still putting poison in their body you know god gave us the poppy flower god gave us the cocoa leaf god gave us the marijuana plant for a reason for example you look at marijuana we were given 20 plants historically speaking going back to ancient times we have over 5,000 strains of marijuana available to us right now 4,980 of them are made for profit made by man and in my experience, I use natural medications now, including marijuana. And it's been a huge problem for me to find those specific strains that do what they're supposed to do, which is enlighten me, to open my mind up, to allow me peace and calm while I'm going through my traumatic events. Because the majority of marijuana out there just gives you couch lock. You grab a bag of cheesies and you're playing video games because people want to block out their minds. They don't want to think about their stuff. In order to heal, you actually got to take all those rocks out of your backpack and acknowledge your thoughts and your emotions one at a time build a new ladder of life to get out of that hole and you need something there to do it with you it's really hard to do it on your own you know so going back to the research of the upside down world we're in right now is causing a lot of death in the way that we're doing things right now and i think what we need to do is we need to get back to the roots of creation we need to get back to using things that are natural including each other you know um I, like I mentioned before i used equine therapy canine therapy art therapy um, an abundance of what I call natural and renewable resources. And when you bring them all together in, into one kind of place or one process, it helps and it's helped me. So to get out of this upside down world, what I've done is I've put together a not-for-profit agency called New Hope Field of Dreams. <clears throat> and we're bringing together our local community resources to present the problem, uh, to provide solutions and to promote the solutions. And the way that we're doing that is there are a bunch of us from the frontline community or who I call our local heroes who are coming together to present the problem. Our goal for that is to present a 12 part documentary that right now calling the war on mental health. And we're gonna to talk to the people. We're gonna go out to the, the hotels and the alleyways and talk to the homeless people and ask them those two questions. Why don't you wanna to go to a safe place? Tell us about your experience with the currently insured mental health system and listen. And then talk to the police officers and the paramedics and the firefighters who attend these mental health crisis calls and ask their experiences with it on the job and also how that has a ripple effect on their family at home. And then we go and talk to the nurses, the nutritionists, and the social workers, and eventually the doctors and psychiatrists. And we 
ask them about Sally Ann and Billy and Joe and all these people who were under their care and ask them what happened. And there's, there's, it's not their fault, you know. Uh, they're, they're given a book, they're given a system that they need to follow. There's a lot of injured people out there right now and they're overwhelmed and they don't have the answers clearly. And the mental health side, like I've mentioned, is, is huge. What I've experienced in my own personal life through the visions that I receive on a regular basis are impactful. They're, they're amazing. Uh, recently, uh, I've been having my spiritual eyes opened up, so now I'm seeing colors uh, in the clouds. And that's, that's messed up. That's really messed up. I see shadows, you know, around people, you know, that's, that's supernatural. You know, I can't even say crazy because I'm beginning to understand why I'm seeing these things. You know, it gives me a different perspective on things. Through my journey of healing, I've also been given the power of, from God to heal other people through touch. Um, and I feel transcending pains in my body that tell me where other people's injuries are. Separated shoulders, broken toes, emphysema, cancers, stomach issues, kidney stones, like so many different things where I myself have those pains in my body, but then I realize that it's the person in my environment that has those pains. And I've personally experienced them when I've laid hands, I've felt people's bones pop, I've felt their tendons move, I've felt their knee bubble, I've like weird, weird things, man, but they, they're healed and that's weird but true you know and when i begin to understand my own person and how i operate now it brings so much revelation towards the mental health industry and and what people are experiencing i was feeding the homeless in oshawa a couple of years ago and there's this girl going around in the park with a bible in her hand and she's yelling at people saying you need jesus you need jesus and get satan out of you and they're ready to punch the shit out of her man and i was like whoa 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 girl what's up what's up and i went over and i'm like hey how are you and she looks at me she's like oh hi i'm like yeah i'm okay I, I got jesus he's like they need jesus and i'm like yep yeah, you're right that's why they're here they're they're homeless and they need food they need love and i said what do you see she's like what do you mean what do i see and i'm like you know what i mean what do you see you see lights you see shadows she says I, I see like shadows like little like creatures you know like that guy over there he's got like little things coming out of his pant leg and i'm like okay okay you're not crazy i said what you have is a spirit of discernment discerning of spirits i said come on over here and i showed her in the in the word where it, where it says that and i said i want you to do this i want you to sit here i want you to look at that guy's leg where those things are coming out the bottom and i just want you to say this i want you to say demons be gone in the name of jesus say it three times if you need to so she says it and poof, they're gone and she's like wow they're gone i'm like yeah don't yell and scream at people man the name is above all names like and she's like wow so all of a sudden this woman who's not that she was going to hit people. She's not far from it, though. Now she's sitting under a tree doing that, you know? That's weird. Yeah, that's true, though, brother. Like, that's that's my own personal experience. I'm not reading a book and telling you uh, some story, man. Fuck that's weird. That. It's really weird. weird, right? And, and what we are here for from my transition is to do just that, man. Like, I don't, I don't want to get too, too deep with stuff, but times are changing, as we can see with things around us. People are going down a, a wide gate and doing what the fear box tells them to do, and that's, that's fine. You know, I don't judge people in any way, shape, or form. I sit in my place of truth, and I recognize what's happening, and, you know, I, I want to shift back and forth, you know, through different perspectives. I have my perspective of the way things are right now and very yeah. powerful very life-changing right and Definitely. like it's cool to see that perspective an officer goes to the situation oh i'm seeing creatures i'm seeing different shapes and forms different things and then you know the cop trying to de-escalate right. it and move it to because of the training positive. yes because it's it's a trained yeah. trained thought police service the paramedics and the firefighters the front line the nurses the doctors the psychiatrists no one teaches them that stuff and you know who else doesn't teach that stuff it's what they call the church people that go to these buildings and say they believe in Jesus and then they do what they do at home and they walk past homeless people, bro. Like, I hate religion, man. Like, I, I love the truth. I love Jesus. I, I love the word of God because it is it is true. I, I, I hate religion. There's 42,000 different denominations that believe in God. You can't even have a barbecue together. Come on, man. We're all the same. Enough. Enough of your silliness, man. It doesn't matter if you're white, black, Chinese. It doesn't matter if you're transgender, transphobic, you're homo, whatever. I don't care. You're a human being. I love you. Period. Enough of the judgment enough of the hatred enough of the division man like just look at each other from a different perspective we're all hurt because the world around us sucks and a lot of people here are in a lot of pain suffering from everything right and like you said you have these hardcore religious people 
you know, preaching their own word, but they're not really yeah. following with what they're guided to actually do. Do you know what I mean? Like no, they're actually, really. they're saying that they, that they want to help homeless people. They want to do this. They want to do that. Like you I said, but then just do it instead of just do like it. faking yeah. it. Because if, if we just keep faking it, just like we are right now, we're going to be in the same success that we are right now, which is horrible. Right. right. People and, perish due to lack of knowledge. Yeah. And information's power, man. Right. And yeah, so yeah. do not conform to patterns of this world, but transform your mind. Like people are dragging their knuckles around in the mud, picking up worms and dirt, just throwing them at each other. Like enough. Don't get consumed in the world. The world is not where we want to be. And I mean like the devices of the world, you know, those things that distract us from our purpose. Uh -huh. Get away from them, man. That's why I love being in this trailer because it's my environment. I can create in this environment. I can collaborate to bring a group of a hundred people together from across Ontario and Canada to provide this documentary of truth build places like New Hope, Field of Dreams, Family Revival Retreat. You know, it's a big thing that we need to do. And those who want to will, those that don't want to can do what they need to do. That's cool, no judgment. We know we just got out of a pandemic pretty much, right? This term that I'm gonna be saying is called social pandemic. So it's basically meaning that like COVID issue that we're dealing with, it's the social aspect of society. And that's kind of what I mean by social pandemic, meaning that like, you yep. know, there's so many issues within society that if we don't fix it over time, it's going to lead to a lot of dangers for a lot of individuals. And it's going Agreed. to lead to a lot of problems. And I really do Agreed. think right now there is a social pandemic in society for first responders. And I think that there's a social pandemic for people that are suffering from mental health, you know, and yep. people are just saying, we have these services to provide for you. We have this, we have that. But what happens if there's a person genuinely wants to try to make a difference for people you know it, it's in an institution it's not actually like face to face compared to like what you're offering mm. in your organization right it's just it's crazy that you know police services and other areas that are involved in law enforcement and first response doesn't apply some of these methods as ways to rehabilitate versus going to these other mental health facilities yeah and it's just the books that they read and it's just the instructions that they're given like when i was the beginning of I guess for two years, I was going down to headquarters to see medical advisory services. And I took part in Can Praxis uh, Equine Therapy. And it was incredible, the uh, the experience that I had down there. And I was telling Dr. Windsor at uh, the Toronto Police Medical Advisory Services about this. And he said, quote unquote, if you believe that riding around on horses is going to help you, you got something else. First off, we're not riding around on horses. We're actually learning about pressure and release and how to, you know, you have no idea what you're talking about. And I, I sent him, I sent the Toronto Police Association, the wellness people, an email back in April of 2018, inviting them to an open house on May the 9th, Mother's Day, I believe it was, in Ashburn, Ontario, at a ranch where Camp Praxis was going to tell people from the first responders community what they're all about. No one from the Toronto Police showed up. They, they didn't care, you know, they have a book. They have their uh, idea. I, I've been in touch with a number of people within the Toronto Police Service, not only at my level, but within the Toronto Police Association. They don't seem to care. Um, they, they have their own interests at mind. I would say that the Toronto Police Service itself is a very fractured and splintered organization when it comes to dealing with their members' mental health. One hand doesn't know what the other hand is doing. They don't communicate together. They don't collaborate together. And that's that's a problem. From my perspective and what we're building these retreats across Canada for is when a, a frontline worker or, or who I call a local hero becomes aware of an injury, whether it's a catastrophic event at work or accumulation of a number of injuries and they present to their supervisor that they're hurt or injured at this point the police services act a medically trained doctor who would book them off sick immediately they would be met by a trauma trained psychologist and a team of peer-to-peer -peer support helpers who would basically take them to a safe environment like new hope field of dreams they would invite their family to come and be part of the process they would be triaged properly they would be given a safe and comfortable environment to stay if they wished they would be provided with a multitude of resources and options and we would self-tailor the program towards them and their family and they would be assigned somebody who is their mentor, their partner, their sponsor, whatever you want to call it, through the entire process. So at any time, at any moment you have an issue, you know, you can call somebody and they will answer the phone. You know, and that's what needs to happen, you know. Let this that is the, this is the real changes that needs to happen though, because 
know, we can we can keep sending people home and contemplate their thoughts, right? But by you creating this program and by you creating this organization, it's going to be life changing for a lot of people. Right. And, and I do yeah. think that people that are first responders need more programs like this, where right. And it's are, also the, yeah. the interactive ones. So looking with the Peterborough Police Service, for example, in the court of the lakes police service starting pilot projects with them next year where their teams would come up for a day or maybe a couple of days uh, uh, at various points to basically unwind come up here ride around a horse for a while maybe go for a trail walk or do something in nature until we get the art therapy mobility centers up basically just offering that so when we are up and running we're looking at building programs with our frontline workers on a regular basis so they can have a, a getaway day an unpack day and an unload day or maybe it's a two-day thing and make it mandatory you know my mandatory days were at Ginsburg Wong down at uh, Queen and St. Patrick drinking after shift that was productive in the aspect that you could actually talk about the stinkies and the holy shit mo moments and, and have that uh, dark humorous conversations that other people are messed up, that other people think are messed up. But it was necessary because we didn't take those rocks home with us and throw them at our families. We left them on the bar floor. Um, but this is a different way of doing things. Obviously, there's no alcohol involved at this site that we have. And it's just providing a safe environment, like-minded people where they can sit down and they can express their thoughts of taking part in that catastrophic car accident or arrest or whatever it was. And to unpack it, inviting teams. For example, the one that took my, how do I, how do I say this? For example, the one that killed my murder suspect or had to take his life. Um, having that whole team come up, that would have been good. Not just a little debriefing session in a in a police station but in a different environment do you feel that traumatic incidences for police services do you feel that they need to do more steps than what they're doing after a situation for example like you were in an event it was traumatic and someone's life was taken and then you go back to the police station they do the debrief of the situation what services do you think or what would you recommend to people that have been in this situation to deal with their stress at the time Based on the current situation and the way that the laws are and how the SIU kidnaps you and puts you in a private room and tells you you can't talk to people and doesn't give you access to a lawyer until you write your notes up. In that particular moment, I guess you got to do a lot of self-reflection and meditation because you're alone and you have no one to help you. That's the real situation right now. When an officer becomes involved in a shooting, they're secluded and put into an area. They used to be able to talk to a lawyer who would then help them write up their notes. But then what they found was that the notes were the, of the lawyer's thoughts, not of the officer's thoughts. So now they do not have access to a lawyer. So right now, just a lot of self-reflection, just like uh, being thrown in a cave all by yourself after you did your justified duty. Good luck, and unfortunately. That's, and that's not the way to do things. It's not the way to... No, no, but that is the way things are right now. Unless they've changed in the last little while, that, that's my understanding of what happens when an officer becomes involved in a shooting in Ontario. That's that's pretty, pretty wrong and insane. Same, I think. 100%. They should be met by a trauma-trained psychologist, like I said, a medical doctor who books them off sick. That trauma-trained psychologist will help them process their thoughts in that moment and their emotions. They will not write their notes. They will not tell them how to write their notes. They will just allow them that safe space to get through their emotional state of just taking somebody's life. That's important. This you know, not being put in a room and, and separated. You're separated from your team as well, which I can understand on an evidentiary base when you're trying to Prove that a police officer took somebody's life and did wrong, which is the entire aspect of the SIU's mandate. When there's police wrong, suspected police wrongdoing, we're put into situations where we're forced to kill people because the system doesn't heal them. Not our fault at all. We're trained. Look at Frasillo, who shot the guy in the streetcar in Toronto. The rules that we were told was there's a 21 foot space. When someone armed with an edge weapon, if they're within 21 feet of you, you will be stabbed unless you have your weapon out. And you might also be stabbed even if you do have your weapon out just based on momentum. And they demonstrated that with a Sharpie and paint pellet guns. The other thing they tell us about interactions with people with edge weapons is once you, you have to draw a line in the sand. So essentially, if you cross that line, you come any closer to me, I am going to shoot you. And then the third thing is to shoot until the threat stops. So in that instance, Priscilla was presented with a guy with an edge weapon. He was less than 21 feet away, substantially less, probably about maybe 12, although there were stairways and a door that he could have closed. We weren't trained how to close doors from the outside of a, of a bus, nor did he have a taser on him. So he was presented with an edge weapon. He knew he was with a the 21 feet he told the guy not to cross that white line or he'll shoot him he crossed that white line coming 
closer to his 21 foot proximity and shot him when he fell to the ground he started to twitch he started to grasp at the knife so he shot him more we were trained to do all three things that he did he was convicted and put in jail for killing that kid on the subway or on the streetcar and there was also evidence that suggested that the youngster wanted to die by suicide that day at the hands of a police officer that's a problem when your training puts you in jail i've been in situations where i've been given a form one to enforce which is an admission to the mental health unit so I have the authority under the Mental Health Act to use as much force as necessary because I have this piece of paper issued by a doctor to say, bring her in. I had one where I was wrestling with a 90-year-old woman. Put her in handcuffs, brother. I was like three seconds into that. I'm like, what the fuck am I doing? Why am I wrestling with my great-grandmother, my grandmother? Why am I doing this? She did end up coming with me. Like It was just incredible, the, the situations that were put in and the law that we're told to do. And it's really wrong that we're put into this position and that, you know, there's people that are suffering from this on a daily basis not just from you but it's, it's upon millions of people that are in this in this situation right where you, you're yeah. trained to do something that's right from wrong you think that it's right so you do it the training behind it and the understanding on how to deal with certain situations they make it sound like you're not human they make it sound like you know right. that it's you're very, not you're like not you human said, like robotic yeah, robotic and, yeah. and not emotional but humans have to humans need to respond though with emotional response right and the reason is is because people want love people want comfort and people want care right yep. the only way to really reassess a situation is really by having some empathy on the situation and really communicating that out. Because I found that within my career and within your role, we de-escalate rules all the time, but we're just complete robots and we're like, no, do this. They're not gonna listen to you. No one's gonna no. listen. Imagine if we had a different angle on how we approach certain people and how we approach 100%. certain things, right? Yes, we love the You're more, way more success with it. And yeah. it's, the, it's the empathy rather than the sympathy, having an empathetic approach. And it, it makes a difference. I even found in my interrogations, major crime, we had a guy that did a, one B&E, he was brought in and the old school guys were doing their tactics and I decided to go back and have a conversation with him and I opened up just like you said I said how are you what happened why are you here tell me about yourself and not all of a sudden but he's all he just said to me I'm smoking two thousand dollars worth of crack a day I lost my daughter she's out here I'm homeless blah 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 he ended up confessing to over 100 B&Es you know and that was for his benefit because he was able to do his time in BC to be closer to his daughter but rather than you know just doing old school policing have a conversation with somebody, you know, and that's what I've found. Like I've been in front of uh, girl guys and scouts and stuff like that in my uniform and have my gun and my taser and my stick and my handcuffs and all this stuff. I say to the group of kids, what do you think is my most powerful weapon that you see right here? And of course the boys say the gun and the girls say the stick and the taser. And I said, no, I said this and this. I said, I've never shot anybody. I've never tased anybody. I've never hit anyone with my stick. I've never pepper sprayed anybody ever. This is what's got me out of my situation. I said, I'm five foot seven, 150 pounds at best, maybe 160 when I got some meat on me, but I, I can't fight 300 pound fellas. And I honestly have never used any of those weapons. I pointed them at people, but I've never deployed them, you know? And it's it's so true when you get into a situation, especially in an undercover capacity, when, when you don't have those tools with you, you're, you're left with nothing but that, your brain in your mouth to get yourself out of some very dire situations. So it's important to have, yeah, and a lot of people, like you said, just sympathize with people as opposed to empathize. When the empathy is where you make that connection, where you can actually make a difference in someone's life rather than just the fact. We are rushed because there's only so many officers on the street. I just need the facts. I gotta go. I just need the facts. I gotta go. I'm sorry that this happened. I need the facts. I gotta go. Here's victim services. Here's this. Here's that. Not that we're supposed to be social workers, although I was probably more of a social worker when I was a cop than I was an enforcement guy because I, I just like to talk, talk to people and to try to help, you know, not just jack them up with a Form 9 for having a joint in their pocket or something like that, but talk to them. And be real with them and explain why they did something wrong instead of yeah, just yeah. hitting them with the book. Because if you hit them with the book, you know, like, yes, I understand that there's some people that deserve to be in the system. I'm not saying that they don't. I definitely think yeah, yeah. that there should be a system in place, but empathize on the whole situation. Because yeah. dealing in the world of law enforcement, you have to have an understanding on how to calm someone down. I think people really need to understand that if you come through an empathizing point of view, a lot of our conflicts, a lot of these shootings, and a lot of these overdoses wouldn't be happening. And a lot of the time is, yeah. is that people that are in these situations in the first place, 
tend to have a bad environmental background in the first place like we talked about earlier you know what yep. i mean they're in a crack house with their mom he's 18 years old and the only thing he's been doing for the last 12 years is smoking meth with his mom and dad they're in the basement yep. and then he's outside having a joint even though it's illegal to smoke it in a public place you know they still act the same as if this guy was you know shooting right. a gun or had a gun in their possession right but the thing is is that maybe if you approach it in a different situation and you actually deal with the problem head on and you try to actually take in what they say and create positive impact i think yep. that a lot of people wouldn't be in the same position that we're in today you know yeah and, and that, that starts with our doctors and that starts with doctors that starts with psychiatry yeah. That starts with everything, right? We shouldn't, like, as first yeah. responders, be responsible for dealing with people's emotional situations. We should be dealing with robberies. We should be dealing with thefts. We should be dealing with violent crimes. And they should lessen once the doctors actually begin to talk to people and provide the proper resources to, to help people. Yeah, and, and I, I definitely think you're spot on about that, right? In our society today, like, what would you recommend for for someone that's in the emergency services, right? If they ever come through these problems or these issues, how do you, um, like, what type of therapy would you suggest them to do? Like, yes, call a friend if they need help. Reach out and phone to friends and family. Try to do meditation. Try to do all these other things. But what would you recommend? to somebody that would be suffering the same emotions that you went through as an officer because you were so good, right? Like you really cared about the the community and you made an impact for society. And then, and, you know, PTSD came down the road, you know, that's what ended the career because of the fact mm -hmm. of so much stress and so much buildup of all the things that we're just talking about, right? Yeah. But imagine if we can cut all of that in half by just like, you know, making a great impact for society by providing ways for them to do therapy and a way for them to actually rehabilitate properly. A lot of people now don't get that one-on-one -on -one time with the therapist. A lot of people don't get that one-on-one -on -one growing time because of their environment, right? So what would you recommend to them? To the people that are like suffering right now, what would you recommend them to do? My experience is generally people like myself can provide a lot more depth of education about recovery than someone who's read a book or taken some courses or gotten some sort of a degree. Very important to have a trauma trained psychologist or psychotherapist or a practitioner who knows about specific things that we go through. Yeah, you know, it, it is pretty limited right now um, with where you can go and it also depends on your profession and what coverage you have. Uh, there are a number of not-for-profit and charitable organizations out there that do offer programs uh, like and Praxis is more on the horse equine therapy. Uh, Wounded Warriors is another one. They do have some very effective programs. Badge of Life Canada. There, there's, a, there's a few organizations out there right now, but again, it's depending on your current insurance system, uh, the availability of these programs. And it all goes back down to money. It all goes back down to organizations too, right? right. So you mentioned earlier about the funding of stuff and the money and whatnot. Um, they don't need to increase the money. They just need to redirect the money towards proper proven resources and stop wasting money on things that don't work. Like it's just the smart business decision to do. Maybe you just need someone that has a business degree somewhere in the world to actually do this. And obviously I'm being a little bit facetious because they're just blind to the truth. Any normal business manager could see that what they're doing right now is not actually working other than the fact that it's it's a, a billion dollar industry that uh, people drive around in fancy cars and have big houses because of pills so it's crazy right with this whole yeah. pharmaceutical society and with everything that's going on right i'd like to make a sponsorship for within this podcast for new hope field of dreams which is the family revival retreat and their plan is to restore revive and promote the natural healing of all canadians starting with our local heroes and their families bringing us back to the roots of creation and providing a new hope for generations to come their goal at new hope field of dreams is to promote this collaborative natural solution across canada to provide solutions i really want to thank you so much for talking about your organization and talking about 
what you offer within your organization because there needs to be a lot more people that have the same passion as you, the same type of drive right. to really care about Canadians and to care about society. And I really think that it all starts off as you as an individual believing in yourself every single day. Mm -hmm. People that are in PTSD, you know, and people that not just PTSD alone, but mental health issues. What is the solution to the problem? Am I going to be able to be successful? Am I able going to be, am I going to be happy? Am I going to be successful? These are all the questions that people are wanting to know that are suffering from mental health, people that are suffering all across Canada. I'm so glad that you were able to point out a lot of the different issues that that we've had in our society and the issues that have been faced with this. I appreciate so much of your time with everything that is going on in regards to this topic. Imagine if we had New Hope Field of Dreams everywhere. Imagine if we had New Hope Field of Dreams in Ontario, Alberta, Manitoba, all of all these places. Yep, right? that's the goal. It will right? happen. Yeah, and like, I really do think that your program will make a passion for society. I really do think you're gonna make a difference for a lot of people. And Thank you. And people are gonna make change. People are gonna make differences because of you. And I really do appreciate you explaining you. about your organization and about who you are, right? It's just so special. Right, and yeah, it is. I just really wanna say that you've been an inspiration for myself and I've looked up to you for many years. I truly believe you are gonna make a great impact and change within Canada. The world of mental health within Canada has been such a serious problem for first responders and throughout my episodes you'll be seeing the real issues that are impacting society today and also providing you tips and tricks on how to be successful within your day-to-day -day life. I want to motivate you in becoming successful. I want to ensure everyone understands the seriousness of mental health and how to take care of your mind for essential happiness and self-growth for yourself because I really do believe that you or anyone else and Jason and myself can really become better as individuals. If if you do this, I, I'm sure you can believe in it. And I'm sure that if you just put that effort for yourself first before someone else, you're failing by refusing to acknowledge its importance of significance. I really want to make an impact for the world. And I, and I really thank you for being my first interview. And I thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to do this. And I appreciate you yeah. for sharing your spiritual thoughts, personal opinions, and your work experience. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, I appreciate you taking the time to speak with me about this. Getting the conversation going is the first thing, and awareness, knowledge, obviously, proper education is what's going to change things. And as long as we center our thoughts on love and respect each other and not judge each other, I think we can actually do what we need to do, and that's to bring proper change for mental health.